<laughs> thank you, thank you. I'm, I'm Diane Nelson. I'm the president of DC Entertainment uh, and Warner Brothers Consumer Products. And we're thrilled to be here today to celebrate with all of you. Um, so for the first time, we're bringing together the worlds of entertainment and public service to highlight the story of America and current issues through the lens of superheroes and comics. And in honor of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. and frankly, the last couple of days leading up to this weekend's celebration, I want to um, remind us all of a quote that he gave, which is, there comes a time where silence is betrayal. And believe me, I have an awful lot I'd like to say to break that silence, but I'm not going to. We're gonna to use today's event to do so because that's really what it's all about. Comics is truly an American art form. You open a comic book, you'll see America in the pages, the people, its values, its struggles and its triumphs. Superheroes and supervillains have been society's mirror they're a reflection of both what is right and what is wrong in our culture. It all started with Superman in 1938 with Action Comics number one, whoever said that. This year, 2018, we're gonna be celebrating the 80th anniversary of Action Comics. And in April, we're gonna celebrate the unprecedented 1,000th issue of that book. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Since the birth of Truth, Justice, and the American Way, comics have tackled issues of all sorts, race, gender, sexuality, politics, and war. And that's what we want today to be about with the various panels you're gonna experience. You're going to hear from really talented creators, creative people, both those who create our comic books and those who bring these books to life in television. We put together these smart people on really interesting panels and our hope is that it inspires conversation and a really rich dialogue, which comics have done for many years. And then also the timeliness of our being here to celebrate on the weekend honoring Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. is really fitting, particularly as we gather here in our nation's capital to sort of revel in the world of superheroes. We're gonna celebrate in particular one superhero who originated in the DC Comics 40 years ago. Inside the CW Network's Black Lightning, or new show, in a fictional world called Freeland, a man named Jefferson Pierce strives to bring an example of hope to the young people that he inspires every day as their principal. With Black Lightning, although he may be a fictional superhero, the ideals of real life, doctor, uh, real life hero, Dr. King, love, hope, respect, dignity for all mankind, all of these still resonate in today's world. In fact, you could argue they're more important than ever right now. So during this holiday weekend, we hope you find some inspiration within Black Lightning, the first African-American DC superhero to have his own dedicated comic book, which will now be coming to television in its own show. We can't wait to share this new series with you. And so, uh, in addition to tonight's premiere, we're gonna, right here in the museum, bring you a sneak peek of what's to come starting this next Tuesday night, January 16th on the CW and in subsequent Tuesdays over the course of the season. We're incredibly proud of this show and we hope you find it as inspiring and entertaining as we do. So before I turn you over to the fun part of the day, I also wanna um, just quickly acknowledge some colleagues of mine who are here, uh, our heads of the Warner Brothers Television Group, Peter Roth and Jeff Schlesinger are here. Yeah. Our amazing producing partner, Greg Berlanti, and I believe his friend, Sarah Schechter, friend and producing partner. I, could, I haven't seen her yet, I'm pretty sure she's here. Uh, my colleagues, our publishers, Dan DiDio, Jim Lee, and our chief creative officer, Jeff Johns, are all here. And most importantly, I want to thank Lisa Gregorian, who heads marketing for Warner Television and is responsible for everything you're going to experience today. Hope you enjoy it. Thank you.
Hi everyone, I'm Ben Brown from Warner Brothers Television Publicity and welcome to our first panel of the day, The Art of the Matter from Sketch to Screen. This behind the scenes look at the creative process provides an origin story of how some of DC's superheroes on the page have evolved into some of TV's hottest superheroes on screens all over the world. Now without further ado, we have a brief uh, reel that we're gonna show for you. Then USA Today's Brian Truitt is gonna join the stage and lead the panelists in conversation. Thank you very much and we hope you guys enjoy today. With all the loss that we have suffered, it's important that we embrace the miracles too. I think hardship is what makes us stronger. Where did you come from, Barry Allen? You took an 11-year-old boy with a broken heart and you gave him a home. Looking back, I realized that that was the night that we fell in love. I look at you battling the darkness with honor and hope, and I'm reminded there's always another way. Always. Whether you're stuck on another world, whether or not you have your powers, you never give in. It's about one noble idea. That we can all stand up for what's right, no matter what. No matter what. This is a war. I'm not gonna fight it the right way, as I am all this city has. I have no reason to be scared. The man I love is a superhero. You do this, you are someone else. This is who I am. If there's a cost, I'll pay it. For whatever reason, I'm gonna be given extraordinary abilities. You need more than a mask to take on these streets. Being a superhero is not about kicking ass. You have failed this city. Just run as fast as you can. I'll try to keep up. Action! If it does, I will let you know. Sometimes I can come off a little overprotective. The city is getting more and more dangerous every moment. Our children are dying in these streets and no one cares. Now you should at least give a brother a moment to say something heroically clever. Now you just piss me off. Metahuman or not, superpowers or not, you are Earth's mightiest heroes. I feel like I could do anything. What kind of hero you could have made? Hey guys, welcome to DC and DC. As a DC area native, this is pretty cool because usually I have to go to like San Diego or New York for this kind of star power, but I didn't have to go very far for this. So this is pretty great. Uh, first up, we have a couple of folks from DC's Legends of Tomorrow. Uh, Katie Lotz, who plays Sarah Lance and White Canary. And Brandon Routh, Ray Palmer, and The Adam. And next, next couple people, we have the executive producers of, let's count them off, Arrow, The Flash, Legends, Supergirl, and the new show Black Lightning, Sarah Schechter. <laughs> and the guru of the Arrowverse, Greg Berlanti. Uh, next up is a, a guy I'm a big fan of. Um, he's written a lot of the adventures for the heroes we see on TV now. Um, so, and he's the president and chief creative officer of DC Entertainment and the current writer of Doomsday Clock, Jeff Johns. And next up is Team Black Lightning. We have executive producer S Salim Akil.
and star star who plays Jefferson Pierce, aka the Black Lightning, Chris Williams. <laughs> And last up is Danielle Pennebaker from The Flash, who plays Caitlin Snow and Killer Frost. Well, first off, Sarah and Greg, since you, you, you oversee a lot of these characters that we're going to talk about here today, what do you look for in, in comic book characters, whether it's a supporting character like Wild Dog on The Flash? Or, or on Arrow, or Man, Martian Manhunter on Supergirl. What do you look for in, in terms of characters and then bringing them from comic book page to screen? Uh, well, it really grew about, I would say it grew about just naturally in the sense of we started with a core group, of, a smaller group of characters. And you are always, I think, trying to look for um, something different in terms of a character, either their ability or just their essence. But then ultimately, really what you're looking for is another opportunity to, um, for a star, for someone who re you really believe is a star and has a, their own sort of star quality that the audience will want to follow wherever they go and whatever they do. Uh, and th that actor who plays that, fills that role out, really uh, comes with their own talents and abilities and, and, uh, and elements. And it's always really, it's sort of, I would imagine, it's like we, if I were to do the comic book analogy, we're sort of drawing in pencil, and the star brings all the color, you know? Uh, and, and when that person comes, that, they had come with their own level of chemistry, too, with the other actors. And I think um, we're, we're always looking to build a family, you know? I think, I think even though the characters aren't related, uh, you, you see them, we see them very much as a family. And, uh, and so you, you kind of look for, okay, what are the elements of a family maybe that you don't have there or, or that can help push the show in a new direction? And then for us in our, our position now, in terms of the kinds of shows that we're excited to be a part of, it's, it's sort of doing it the same way, which is you know, what's a part of, of this family of shows that is an element or something that we haven't done or gotten to be a part of before, if that makes sense. Yeah. <laughs> Jeff, coming from the, the creative side, and, I mean, and you, you've, done, you've done a lot with the movies and the TV shows for these. For, what is the challenge of bringing some of these characters from from page to screen, and just and, and kind of doing something fresh with them, but also kind of doing justice to where they came from? What are the challenges for you? It, it depends on the day, obviously, uh -huh. and the and the people you're working with. You know, um, the, there's kind of uh, literal challenges of just like you take Wild Dog. You mentioned Wild Dog. He's a pretty obscure character, and so you got to look at that character, and when you translate him into Arrow, he changes fairly dramatically from the comics, but there's still that core, kind of that core essence of the character you want to keep intact. And I think getting to the heart of the characters, like Black Lightning or Flash or Supergirl or Wonder Woman, and, and boiling down to that essence and making sure that essence survives translation, that's really the biggest challenge. And there's so many people working on the shows you really need, and movies and the comics, you really, you know, making sure everyone's agreement on what that essence is, is, is key. Salim, tell us a little bit about the, the road to Black Lightning for you and, and why this character speaks to you and why do you think it's going to speak to the world at large? Well, the road was great. I mean, you get to work with all these people and, and they make it pretty easy because they have a, a level of expertise that I didn't have coming to the genre. And so uh, the best thing to do for me was to listen but also try to maintain uh, the vision that I had in my head. So that was, a, that was a balance. But it was, like I said, it was really helped because I was working with good people who understood that I had never done the genre, but also understood the vision that I was trying to get across. Uh, I think in terms of the character, why it was interesting to me is because I think when we, when we first uh, sat down with Warner Brothers, one of the things I said, and it was accepted, in the way that I meant it, I said that I wanted to reintroduce a certain type of black man into television. Um, and Jefferson Pierce sort of uh, embodied that man, uh, a man who had come from Freeland or Richmond or Chicago, you know, the, the, the more, I guess, tortured parts of those cities. 
but also a man who had uh, taken the opportunities that were given to him and expanded them into a way that he could help his community. That was interesting to me. That was a character that I felt like I could really uh, sink my teeth into. And so um, that's why I sort of got on board. Yeah. Chris, how much did the source material kind of guide you in terms of, of finding out who Jefferson Pierce is? And how much kind of was, was you working with, uh, with uh, Salim about, you know, kind of what, what, what freshness can we bring to this guy? Yeah, I mean, first it, it was um, Salim's vision. I mean, the script um, was so clear and, and exciting. And so then it was after that that I went to all the source material from the 70s on down to see where it came from and realized that it was kind of an, uh, an amalgamation of, of all the, the uh, different versions of the comic book. But um, his vision was, was so on point and, and I identified with, um, I guess, all the human aspects of Jefferson. Um, that, uh, that was really my foundation. Of all the folks up here, Katie, I think you've probably played your character the longest in terms of, of being on TV since Arrow season two. Um, and, and Sarah Lance really isn't somebody from the, the comics. We have, I mean, she was kind of created for the show, but there was a lot of stuff from Black Canary in there as well. Can you remember back to, to when you started on Arrow and kind of what, how you created that character and, and what you thought, you know, and what really got you into her? Ooh. Um. Yeah, I guess it has been a really long time. <laughs> and I'm really not that much in the comics either. I was like, why am I on this panel? <laughs> um, I think Sarah Lance kind of, we're not really sure where, where she fits in the comics, but it was the kind of a 1.0 uh, or a pre-version, precursor to Black Canary. And moving that into the White Canary has been... It's, it's such a journey. I mean, when I look back at where my character started on Arrow and where she is now, uh, I'm really uh, thankful for like the journey that the writers have kind of given her. She's really gotten to grow. And I think just when I started, I, I had no idea what I was getting into. <laughs> uh, I remember producers pulling to the office and they're like, and you are Laurel Lance's long lost dead sister and also Black Canary. <laughs> Uh, and so then I started reading the comics, and I, I wasn't really into comics before that, and um, there's so much there. I mean, it's, they're a lot of fun. Now, Brandon, this is your second go-round in terms of superheroes, because you were one Superman, one of my favorite Superman, by the way. Oh, Thank you. Man. Thank you. What's changed the most? In t because, you know, I mean, you, you have to obviously get find out more about Superman playing him, you know, back in the day, but also now you have another character to find out more about. How has that process changed over the years from, from when you first played Superman till now when you play Adam? I mean, in terms of, of executive producers and, and creatives and, 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 and finding the, the way into a superhero. Well, I think for me, oh, my mic's on. Uh, I think for me, <laughs> Uh, one of the big differences, I, I'm much more ch mature and experienced in, as far as, uh, as an actor in the, in the business of being an actor uh, from 2005 when we filmed Superman Returns. <laughs> um, and so I, I feel much more comfortable and at ease on set uh, to speak my mind, to say when something's not working for me, to make things more real. And, and that's what we're trying to do as actors is make everything real, as real as possible. Um, so, uh, and also to, to, to then be able to collaborate. Um, and so the opportunity with uh, Ray Palmer and Adam was that I had, I felt greater uh, empowerment to speak my mind and to say, hey, I love what this is, could, could also be this, could we do this? And to, to Greg and Sarah and the team and Jeff and everybody the team uh, allowed me uh, to, us all to make this, to, to do as, as Greg said, add the color to this great foundation that they, they put in place for Ray and, and the Adam and, and that the comics and everybody who had done up, up until that point and I'm taking it on this different journey and adding these different shades of color. Um, it's, a, it's an amazing collaborative process and um, I think embracing what everybody's brought to it and then getting to add my own piece uh, is what makes it creatively exciting um, for me and uh, uh, and, and, a, and a great joy to, to be able to play this character. And Danielle, you, Danielle, you had the challenge of taking a, 
kind of what a character considered mostly a supervillain, and then make her a good a good guy, and then kind of creating her a supervillain, and then kind of creating something in between. Um, was <laughs> is that kind of but was that kind of how the road was? Is just kind of like figuring out what this person would be like as somebody who was good, and then figuring out how she turns. Um. Yes. I mean, <laughs> a little bit of what Cress was saying, you know, there is a long history of Caitlin Snow's and Killer Frost in the comic books, but I leaned more into our scripts and the characters we were developing there. So I think when we started the show, sort of the Killer Frost, uh, when she would be appearing was a, a bit of a question. Um, and it has been fun. I think I've tortured all the writers on our show because <laughs> I keep asking questions about where we're going with Killer Frost and um, what the plan is with her. But you know, our show has jumped around to so many different timelines, and um, with Flashpoint, it's you know, as an actor, it's fun to get to invent these characters, um, and also particularly, I feel on Flash, and I don't know how about the other shows, but like to get to be a villain on on our show is really fun because you get to play and stretch, and you really you almost can't take it too far. Um, so yeah, it's been great. I've really gotten to do a lot in the last almost four years. Uh, for Sarah, Sarah Gregg and, and Jeff, and, to, and because you know, it used to be you only found superheroes on mo in movies, and now we have kind of a golden age of, of superheroes on TV thanks to you guys. What, what what is it about this medium that that makes it so kind of rich for telling these types of stories? I, I would just say that I think television is such a great medium for comic books because comic books have many iterations and they tell stories over many episodes and you really, it's all about the characters and then the characters go on adventures and I think that's true of television as well. And um, there's, some, there's, there's more time to kind of get into character and story and it's as much about who these characters are and what Jeff said, the essence of these characters versus being just about plot, if that makes sense. You have to always jam a lot of plot into a movie. We obviously have a lot of plot too, but, but you have a little more room for the characters. And I also think a uh, smaller point just is that technologically speaking, technology caught up with film to a degree that you could actually make something that really felt and reminded you, um, you know, of the book. I mean, when, when we were experiencing Flash for the first time together, we didn't really know if we'd be able to have a character on television on a weekly basis that embodied we knew characteristically we could embody the heart and soul of the Flash, but we just didn't know visually, and that was such an important component. And we were really discovering it at, at the moment we were doing it. And, and, uh, you know, and, and thankfully we had the support you know, of the studio and the network to say, yeah, go, go try this, you know, and we'll give you the means and the resources to do it. Uh, and, and that was a breakthrough moment, I think, for us. And, and it led to powers on the other shows and things like that. And that's obviously just a tool in the toolbox, and it's never the leading tool. But it's a really important part of, of, I think, the experience that you're watching. And audiences are, are really savvy and, and don't distinguish between, and I don't as an audience member, you know, I want the shows I watch that are about those characters to be as interesting and fascinating and feel as big uh, and sweeping as the films I watch about those characters. And, uh, you know, and, and luckily the timing was, was sort of just right and we were able to build an infrastructure to support that. Yeah, and I'd, I'd say, like, too, when we first started talking about Flash, it was, it was early. Like, Arrow was called Arrow. It wasn't called Green Arrow. Yep. I think there was some fear about totally embracing a superhero show. And when I was a kid, I remember reading some article in a magazine about um, some executive talking about Flash, the TV show they did in the 90s. And they, someone said, well, can he just wear a gray jogging suit so it's more real? <laughs> And I remember being really upset as a kid, like, why would they, why would they ever do that? Like, what's the, like, why would that happen? And, uh, and when we had the chance to work on Flash, and I remember we sat down, and they're like, well, maybe he doesn't call himself Flash for a year. Like, and we were like, let's make this show embrace and celebrate what the Flash is, why we love the Flash. I also, so I think, like, having people that grew up on these comic books, and, you know, suddenly they're, we're all in the business, and, and everywhere that, that when we said he's gonna wear a red costume, he's gonna have a lightning bolt on him, he's gonna be called the Flash by episode four, like we were, really wanted to, we're gonna, we're gonna do Gorilla Grodd. I remember we had a, there was that cage in the first episode that said, and we wanted to have this gorilla cage that broke out and said Grodd, and everyone was like, cut that, cut that from the, 
thing, and, and we're like, it's not, like, they didn't understand it, and we're just like, you gotta, like, it's garage, you gotta let us do it. That's like, <laughs> <laughs> and like, it was great, because they said, well, we can do a small cage, but then we talked to production, and they, they were like, it's gotta be a big cage. And, <laughs> <laughs> and it was, it was great, but I, I, but I, I think it's, you know, it's, Celebrating and embracing this rather than being like ashamed of it, like ashamed of doing a superhero TV show, which I felt, you know, I felt Flash kind of helped break the doors open and say, we're just going to do it. And then Supergirl, when we talked about it, I remember you were like, we only do it if it's Supergirl in costume and Krypton. And, and you're right, like we, we have to do things that celebrate and own the characters. Greg, go back to when you were figuring out what you wanted to do with Arrow. And did you have the same kind of things that Jeff, Jeff was talking about where, you know, did they wonder why he had to wear like a green hoodie? And, and you know, and, and just because, I mean, we really didn't have the superhero shows like we do now uh -huh. then. I mean, was, it, was that a hard sell? Not really. Uh, uh, <clears throat> the excitement, I think, of doing Arrow was just this notion of, well, we can actually do something on television that they can't do in the movies, which is we can do 23 episodes of an origin story. You know, uh, we can do, you know, now we're in the sixth season. So uh, over 100 episodes, really, of, 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 you know, up through season five, we were doing the origin story of the island. If that had been a film, it would have been 15 minutes in the first act, you know? Uh, and so there, were, there was an excitement, I think, about that. There wasn't a real intention to be build, I think, any kind of universe. It was just, how can we do this character and do it well? And there were a lot of elements about that character that we thought worked for a, a great television show. Uh, you know, the fact that he was a vigilante, that there was a, a, a sense of righting wrongs. Uh, it, w it was more terrestrial than obviously the powered shows that kind of came after it. So um, we had learned a lot from, from stunt work from some of our previous shows about how we could elevate stunts we felt like in a television way that would, again, you know, compete with, with movies and storytelling. But we did have a, 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 a moment in there, which was at the end of Act One, where he killed someone. And that hadn't happened in the DC uh, universe, really, on film, I don't think, at that point. Very coming off Smallville. Yeah. Very different. Yeah. So, um, so that distinguished it. And so people knew. And that was a conversation that we all had, uh, you know, which was, obviously, if we're going to make this real choice, is it going to kill the, you know, people's love or adoration for this character at the outset? Does it damage the show from the start? And it was a, a risk that everybody you know, ultimately embraced and let us take. And I think it helped distinguish the show. And it wasn't to do it just to do it, but we were really showing someone who had been tortured and gone through a lot on this island and was very different than a hero that people had seen before, and it was a redemption story. And so we wanted to start him from a place of, uh, you know, uh, um, a man who needed to be re redeemed. Um, and so those were the kind of conversations we had. But I think really from the beginning, when we were starting, everybody really did want to, uh, it wasn't the comic book stuff that people were as you know, uh, concerned about, it was, it was more always a conversation. And there was different levels of knowledge that people had, you know, in terms of that. We had Slade Wilson that we brought up in that first year, and we had the mask on the island, and, you know, and, uh, you know so there was this sense from the beginning that we were going to, we were putting landmarks of things that we were going to try and answer throughout the year. And the mask was something that people were like, well, why, why the mask? And, right. But they, they were like, they went with it. Everyone went with it. For the actors and in, in, in inhabiting these characters that, that do mean so much to people, and as you as you yourself have gotten into more, know more about comics and probably you know reading comics, stacks of them to get to get prepared for all the characters and everything. Do you do you now do you understand more of the importance to the to them to the world and just how how much they do mean to to fans and not, not just comic book fans but just fans of pop culture? I think I think you know comic books are a different form of storytelling. Fiction books, you have comic books, you have uh, movies, television, but <laughs> in essence, uh, all these characters are a gateway into telling a story. So we set them up with um, a distinct uh, origin story and, and, and sell you on that so that you're like intrigued about this character, and then, then we take them on a journey. So I think if you, if you can just create that, then, uh, uh, you know, then, then you've got people and you pull them in, even if, it, it, if it's changed and adapted. The character Ray Palmer changes. Um, you get uh, in the f in the television version. As long as you get that initial gateway, that thing that brought people into the story, um, and because comic books are colorful and have these kind of outrageous things, it's easier to get into it. Because like, oh, this is what an outrageous thing! But I can't believe I'm reading about this. This happened. Could happen, and now I'm engaged in the story. And then you tell real stories. 
Because it's never about, you know, the saving the world is great, but the powers and all that stuff is, is, is icing on the cake. It's, it's the real story at hand. And, and so, yes, I connect with that. I mean, it's, it's that stuff that we, that we connect with is when our characters have one-on-one -on -one scenes, that that's the power. It's great to be in these big scenes in the bridge and do all this fighting, and that's fun stuff. But for me, creatively, it's having one-on-one -on -one scenes uh, and having that interaction between the characters or getting to tell jokes um, <laughs> and be silly. So, yeah. I think people need heroes right now. Um, mm. And I think comics are about overcoming adversity. Like every, so much of the characters, it's the, such a great journey of overcoming something. And I think when people read it, whatever they're going through in their life, they, they're having to overcome something. And to be able to see somebody do it and do it to help the world is really inspiring. And yeah, especially right now, I think, I think it's, these things are popular because they're important right now because we need heroes and we all need to step up and be heroes. And seeing it and watching it like, makes you feel like you can do it and you can overcome whatever it is you're going through in your life. I mean, I, I come from being a legitimate fan. You know, I mean, I used to wake up the crack of dawn uh, Saturdays to, to listen to, meanwhile, at the Hall of Justice. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Um, and, and on down the line. And I think, you know, as a child, it was um, a way to uh, escape uh, an existence that wasn't too uh, um, joyful. Um, and uh, when you see in your own life, you don't have a lot of control. These, these heroes have the utmost control. And, and you can look at your own existence and go, what if I had super strength? And, I could take out that bully, or you know, I could do this, I could do that. And so now that we're at this place where technology has caught up and, um, um, and we can tell these stories, um, it's, it's our modern day mythology, you know? Um, and it's, it's, it's been our mythology for a long, long time. And now we get to um, take that two dimensional uh, image and put it up and, and do it justice, do it in, the, in, in the, a way that, that um, feeds our imagination. So uh, I love it as a fan, and then to, to be a part of it is just icing on the cake. I, I just feel like it's a dream come true. I'm new to the comic book world, so it's been a fun journey for me, you know, and it is this, it is a different kind of storytelling, and it is fun to get to go on the journeys with these characters. You know, as they were all saying earlier, it's, you become invested, and you get to continue on these journeys and watch them make different choices and grow and learn, so it's, I, I've had a lot of fun with it. Katie said something. Katie said that that you know we need heroes now more than ever, and I, I, it's very true. And for you guys in creating the shows, and I, you know, especially Black Lightning, which you know the the premiere episode kind of deals with a lot of issues we're we're, we're all de dealing with now. Um, in certain in term, terms of characters, in terms of stories, do you find it more and more kind of impacting you in your work? Well, clearly in mine, yes. <laughs> 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 I mean, I'm probably the angriest black man in Hollywood. <laughs> uh, I just had a lot of shit to say, man. I, I don't have to tell y'all about the world. You know, you, you know, you know what it looks like right now, and it just starts to look a little crazier and crazier every day. But so it can't. You know, I'm a very sensitive person, so it affects me. You know, uh, every day. You know. Um, so yeah, I can't help but put it in, in, in my work because I feel like what I'm doing is, is a blessing. It's something that not a lot of people get to do. And so I, maybe this is the wrong way to think about it, but I do feel a certain responsibility to talk about certain things. I still want to entertain. I still want people to have fun. You know, we, we use music to have fun in the show, you know, and he cracks jokes when he's, particularly when he's Black Lightning. But, uh, when you're given an opportunity in these times, and, and I just felt like, man, I gotta say something, you know, just, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. 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 I, think it, I think it's essential that what's happening in, in, in the world is influencing our stories, because otherwise, that, that's what makes it interesting, and that's how we learn, that's how we grow, because we can see what's happening in real life reflected up in this fantastical world, and we go, oh wait, 
uh, that's what I do, or that's what this person does, or I, I have a better understanding seeing it up on screen, hyper-realized, um, so that we can understand also that, that you know, as a superhero, this doesn't mean we can't attain uh, certain aspects and the qualities, those qualities in our own lives. You know, we give it up and say, oh, they're superheroes, I can never be like that. But I think, for me, in my experience of doing this, I've always playing, I've had to do a lot of thinking about what it's like to be a superhero, the most powerful being on Earth. And I think that's one thing that we can all take with us is we, are all, we all have that innate ability in us to be the goodness that is Superman, that is Clark, that is all of these characters. Um, you just may not have, you know, heat vision and be able to fly, but, you know, who knows? But I think we've enough. gone beyond Superman now. I mean, like, you know, I think Green, I think Green Arrow is, is a hero people can look up to. You know, the Atom is. Mm. White Canary is. You know, I, th I think a lot of people can, go, can, can relate to Caitlin Snow in a, lot of in a lot of different ways. Well, also, I just think that representation matters. And so that's why, I mean, I love Black Lightning for that. It was, it was missing from the world. But I think it's like we have a lot of really strong women on our shows. And that's... That, I think you have um, you have different religions, you have different sexuality. You have like there's it, it's about a sort of like kind of a variety and a, to represent back the world that we live in. And I think that that's one of the things that's exciting about comics is it it's like just it's like one step from reality, and it allows us to sort of enjoy and take in all these values. And and um, I just think that it, the opportunity is there to show how great humans can be. And I think that's part of what's fun about it. Yeah, I, th I think that the best comic stories, the best comic book characters clearly are, are metaphors and, and like Superman himself is an immigrant to our world, you know, and proves that he's more valuable than anybody else. And, mm -hmm. and the potential that anyone has to, um, to do that, I, I think since Action Comics number one, it's the comics have always, the good ones have always said something about some, you know, something else. And, and that comes from the creators behind the books. And the shows do that too, because you have all these great writers and actors working on them and, and so on. But when it's just popcorn for popcorn's sake or powers for power's sake, you know, even Grodd can mean, mean something. I don't know why. There's passion means. behind it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's another part of why TV versus film is so great, because what you guys have done with these shows for inclusion is humongous. Mm -hmm. and. I think movies are very risk adverse because the there's finances. so much money behind it that nobody's taking any chances. And with you guys, with the casting, you have Muslim superheroes, we have African American superheroes, we have gay superheroes, bi superheroes, and that's paving the way and we're already seeing it in pro playing out in the movies. And it's before, it's like you never, people wouldn't take those chances and you guys are kind of really laying the groundwork for that to reach even more and more people and become more and more normal. Yeah, I think all, every, every kind of, every person, the, the, if you ever go to Comic-Con, you see that the variety of people that love comic books is, is the variety of the world. I mean, it is, it, it's every kind of shape and color and creed and nationality. People love these, these comic books, and so it's exciting to be able to reflect back the world to them. Yeah, I was just gonna say, I think probably the most rewarding part about what any of us does is when you meet kids that watch the shows and, and you know you think back to when you were a child and when I was a kid and I was reading comic books I just I felt different you know and I was losing myself in these books about people who very often felt different but either alone or together were able to defeat you know undefeatable odds and uh, and it was a hand that was reaching out to me uh, and, I, and I think it's still that hand, and I think we're, we're all very aware of the role that we kind of play in, in, in reaching that next hand, you know, to a new generation and a new group of kids, and we want to be the best version of that, you know. I think we have time for two, two maybe quick questions. There are times when you have a character from the comic books that'll have that aspect of their identity, you can pull that directly into the show, or you have a character that we haven't seen perhaps before in the comics that we can do that as a new sort of step. I was just curious if you could talk a little bit more about that. Yeah, I mean, I think um, Jeff and I probably both, uh, both can. But uh, we, you know, it, it's, I, I think we want to, one of our goals throughout this time has to been increase the diversity of the cast in every regard. Uh, and, you know, I'm an out gay man, so that's LGBT issues have been really important to me throughout that. Uh, we have, I think, across the five shows now, 
five to six regular characters and eight to nine you know, total recurring characters that are, are gay or LGBT. Um, and you know, I, mean, I, I think the, the process is very much you know, for someone like Mr. Terrific, you know, who wasn't gay in the comic books, uh, we knew we wanted to add a gay character to the show. And so we went to Jeff and we talked about it. And he's like, what about Mr. Terrific? And I was like, well, that's a great name for a gay character. <laughs> 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 so uh, you know, so sometimes it happens like that. Uh, when we were originally talking about Sarah Lance, I, I, I don't know really how it came out. I knew that it was something that we wanted to address and that it was, it was in her background and that there'd be a love story with Nyssa. Uh, but it was, it was probably the, that was in the beginning of like, okay, we really want to address this and we want to make it a part of the show. And, and, and you know, part of what does help while you're doing that is people, you get the f feedback, uh, the audience is really responding to characters that aren't just like other characters, you know? Uh, and, and we're all different as people, you know? We have so many colors to us as individuals, internally, externally, you know? And, and, uh, and so even as you evolve certain characters that kind of already existed and are already on the show, you, you hope that they're gonna change and evolve the way that people do uh, and reveal and learn new things about themselves, you know? Uh, which would be an example of Alex's character on, you know, on, on Supergirl. Uh, and so it kind of can come at it different ways. You can come at it really intentionally, like we want to make this character you know, LGBT. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, and then other times it can be a character that already exists and, and you start to have the conversation about their character's growth. And you realize, like, oh, that's, that, that's an element of who they are that they're discovering. I think that's all the time we have. Thank oh, you so much. Oh, there you go. I'm sorry. Oh, 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 oh. One okay. more? One more. Yeah, he's right. standing there. One more. I'll try and be really quick. Um, Chris, Brandon, Katie, thank you for portraying our favorite characters and bringing them to life. Kick a door in, sir. Can't wait to see the show. And Danielle, Salim, Greg, Sarah, I'm sorry, I'm very nervous. Uh, Don't be thank nervous. you for your part in bringing our heroes to life because it just. 20 years ago, we're being thrown in lockers for loving them the way that we do. And you guys, it's different now. And thank you for leading the charge for that. Um, very, very selfish question. Jeff, sir, the master of puppets for DC Universe, thank you very much for everything that you do for it. Tommy Monahan is my, yeah, yeah, yes. I'm sorry, I know we're short on time. Tommy Monahan's my favorite character ever. And I got into him when they re-released the books in 2011. I see tremendous potential for a Hitman TV show. Is there any <laughs> chance in hell that in the future DC would ever consider doing the character? My, my, my standard answer is, I'll, I'll, I'll really answer the question, my standard answer is, and Greg and I joke about this, there's always a chance. <laughs> because there always is a chance, but Just we actually are talking about Hitman. Thank you, thank you very much. Thank you guys for taking your time. Thank you guys. Thank you.